call came within moments of our appeal last month about a man who'd been sending thousands of obscene letters to famous women. It's just offensive. I mean, it really is. It comes, it comes into your life and intrudes itself. It is a form of assault, actually, and it's against the law to send this sort of letter. I mean, it, you could almost call it stalking by mail. Hundreds of viewers rang to help, but as a result of one call in particular, a 72-year-old man from Wigan has been arrested. We want to thank one viewer in particular on a separate case. That person wants to remain anonymous. But I'd just like to tell you, your call to Crime Watch had led to a rapist going down for life. This is what happened. In November, we appealed to find a sex attacker who abducted a teenage girl in Chingford, East London. She left home for a Saturday job. Where are we going? We're going down near Wolfenstein. Why? I'm going to rape you. He drove the girl to the edge of Epping Forest and subjected her to a prolonged sexual assault. Family liaison officer Jackie Hesketh described the girl's ordeal. I can only imagine how terrified she felt as um, he's dragged her from the car. He's had the screwdriver up against her neck most of the time. Um, it would have just started raining by the time they got here. It was dark, it's wet, and she must have been absolutely terrified. During the attack, the girl noticed a very distinctive scar on the man's stomach that she thought looked a bit like a shark bite, and this was a key part of the appeal. Afterwards, when the man's car wouldn't start, callously he forced her to get out to help. Get out, get around the back and start pushing. Having worked on different child protection teams, um, nothing that we see would surprise us anymore. You know, you hear the most horrendous things and then right. something comes along like this and you just think, I can't believe this has happened. Over 200 calls came into the studio that night one from an anonymous caller who named Jeffrey Banks as a suspect. Detectives tracked him down within seven days of the Crime Watch programme and carried out a DNA test. He also had a large scar on his stomach, which matched the description given by the young girl. He eventually pleaded guilty to attempted rape, four indecent assaults and kidnap. Jeffrey Banks was sentenced last week at Snaresbrook Crown Court to life. The judge commended Crime Watch and the police investigation. We've kept the family uh, up to date with the investigation as it's, go as it's gone along and they've asked me personally to pass on their gratitude to the caller that rang into the programme and provided us uh, with, with the information that led to Geoffrey Banks' arrest. We've more results to tell you <clears throat> and 18 new appeals. Coming up, revenge. But what for? The mysterious letter bomb vendetta that threatens to kill children. Just if you stay there, don't move, all right? The astonishing daylight abduction of a woman in the street. The white van man who was hijacked and almost burnt alive. Have you ever come across Ryan Chapman, the one from Lechlade in the Cotswolds? Ryan has upset someone pretty badly. And he doesn't know who or why, and nor does his wife, Alison. Basically, we're in limbo. We can't plan anything, can't do anything. We're constantly always looking over our shoulder. We never know when it's going to be safe again, if ever it will be safe ever again. On the morning of the 14th of August, I received a letter addressed to Ryan. It's nothing abnormal for me to open Ryan's post. I thought the type was a bit different, but nothing other than normal. Um, and I opened it, started to read it, and realised that it wasn't a normal letter. It was absolutely disgusting. Um, whoever it was, with certain aspects, they must have known us. So I phoned Ryan and asked him what the hell was going on. I just got a phone call at work, and uh, it was Alison. She gave me an earful of abuse about when, what, and what I've been up to, what I've been doing. Is this something you're not telling me about, Ryan? What was in it was, it was hard to read. What was in it? Pretty disgusting. So whoever, you know, whoever it is, got pretty sick in the mind. Over the next two months, the family received three more letters, each done on a 30 or 40 year old Smith Corona typewriter. 
threatening to kill the children and demanding that Ryan stay out of Swindon for five years. Which was impossible because I work there, I visit there, shop there, uh, go out pubs and that in Swindon, so virtually it's just an impossibility. So what would you like for lunch? I actually started to let my guard down because we hadn't had anything for quite a long time and I thought perhaps it was over. I'm a childminder and I was actually looking after a child that day, so I went shopping, um, came back from shopping, and there was a parcel on the doorstep. There we go. Went into the kitchen, checked the parcel on the table, um, sat the child up to the table to have some lunch. And then decided to open the post. I remember looking at the label, thinking nothing of the package. I actually opened the brown bag and found inside a Jack Daniels tin. By this time, alarm bells were ringing. I really thought something wasn't quite right, because me or Ryan don't ever drink whiskey. So I decided to open it, and I didn't know what I'd expect to find inside. I just thought perhaps it'd be a dead animal or something. Jessica, stay there, don't move, all right? I just freaked, I went mad. Basically, just grabbed hold of it and threw it into the back garden. We got a package, um, small the tin enough. contained a rudimentary bomb with enough explosive to kill anyone who triggered it. Just after Christmas, it was followed by a one-line message. When I found out what the bomb could have done to us, I felt physically sick to think I was so close to being killed. I thought it was just there to perhaps scare us because it doesn't happen to people like us, you know, not things like that. That was it, we was taken away. No longer allowed to live in Letchlade. I couldn't work. work didn't I? Yeah, couldn't sure. work. Neither of us were allowed to work. Basically, lives have been turned upside down. The vendetta against the Chapmans has been the talk of the village, and someone in Lechlade, or Swindon, must have a good idea of what really lies behind this. Give us a call before somebody gets killed. 24-7, we just constantly, the whole time, trying to think who. And please get in touch if it was you who sent the note to the local police back in December, saying Ryan's got a big secret in his past. I have done things and been in trouble for this and that, but nothing to, I would say, that warrants you know, let a bomb sent to your house. Basically, last eight months, I wouldn't wish on anybody. The children have not done well at all. It's affected them. They have been taken away from their normal home. They have had their lives turned upside down, which hurts, because at the end of the day, they're innocent and they don't deserve anything like this. I just wish it was all over. David, if Ryan doesn't know what's behind this, and you believe him that he doesn't, Absolutely how not. should anybody who's watching Crime Watch have the faintest idea of what's behind it? Well, we're hoping that someone who knows something about his past uh, can come forward and give us a clue as to what it is there that, that's causing this vendetta against him. So maybe something quite trivial to Ryan. Not necessarily big, then, uh, as in Absolutely that letter. Not. That's obviously one line of inquiry, but it could be something... That... It could be something trivial, but, of course, the consequences could have been dreadful with um, Alison causing the death of Alison or the child. But I wonder whether whatever Ryan did might have been trivial to him, but huge to that person, a school bullying or something like that. I think Ryan yes. admitted he did bully a bit at school. Uh, uh, yes, Ryan has said he hasn't been an angel in the past, but certainly um, he cannot recall anything and we can't find anything which may have, you know, have caused something of this degree. This isn't the actual tin but it's identical. These were widely on sale just before Christmas in the area. Um, because he used this tin, the contents, of course, he hasn't got. Or maybe it's somebody who's got one of these miniature Jack Daniels plus the glass. Or did he give somebody that for Christmas without giving them the tin? Absolutely. I mean, the tin is critical. Um, they were widely available, but um, we're very keen to hear from anyone who may know of a connection with Ryan and someone who has this tin, who has seen the glass or the, or the whiskey. Could have been someone who was at school with him, could have been... Uh, could it be someone who's got... You know, they, a viewer knows somebody's got a grudge who's in the air, but they don't know who the grudge is against. Do you want to hear about that as well? Absolutely. 
What we do feel is that it's someone local to Letchlade, local to Swindon, certainly they know Ryan very well. So and with access to typewriters, old-fashioned yes. typewriters. Yes, it's an old-style um, typewriter that was used on the letters. And an old-style uh, electric typewriter as well. So, you know, if you were at school with Ryan, as you've just heard, if you have ever been a friend of him, uh, if you've come to blows with him or know anybody else who has, know anybody who's got a grievance, please get in touch. It's a free call here to the studio, 0500 600 600, or you can call the Instant Room direct on 01 242 276 514. I've been a police officer for 22 years and it never ceases to amaze me what some people will do. This is Meanwood in Leeds and the government is risking a long prison sentence to steal the takings from the till. And this is Nottingham and another man with a gun is willing to terrify others for the sake of just a few hundred pounds. And here in Nailsworth near Stroud, you can't see the gun but the robber appears determined to be seen himself. Three very dangerous men tell us how to stop them. 0500 600 600. Five weeks ago, a Monday morning during the rush hour in Bristol. Were you there on College Green? Do you know anyone who would have been there or was visiting Bristol at the time? You just get up in the morning, be over again. The other day, I was still asleep <laughs> most of the time. And it's the main world. I got off the bus. It was about five past ten past eight, and I was having a few problems with my bank account. So um, I had to go over to the bank. Excuse me, the light, please. Yeah. I've seen him on the bus before, and he just got off and he asked me for a light, a cigarette. Great, thanks. So I gave him a light, and he walked up the steps, and so did I. I started walking along, so I was oblivious to what was around me. Excuse me, you have ten pence? I need to use the phone. Then I just felt this arm around me, and I could just, I just seen the blaze. What in your mock are you screaming? I would cut you. I was thinking, yeah, how can I get someone's attention without them getting hurt? Before I knew anything, really, I was at the car. Things just started going through my head then. Music was loud. And I was thinking, what are they going to do? I thought that I was going to end up like you see some girls. I to be ringing my mum. My dad just really found a body or something. <laughs> she was driven for about 15 minutes, then felt the car go along a cobbled road. She saw railings and water and thinks she might have been in Welsh back. The car stopped, the attack started, the worst bit, and I was blacking out. You can't describe it. You're just crying. You feel every tear coming down. You can't breathe. After she was sexually assaulted by the man in the back, they drove off and dumped her near the fruit market in St. Phillips, an hour after she'd been abducted. Get on, get on. I didn't feel real. I was out of that car and I was there. I was just baffled by it all. And I didn't even think about how I'd start to tell someone. It may have been a BMW, it was certainly black, and a witness may have seen it minutes later nearby on the M32. I joined the motorway, and as I passed the Eastville Junction, I was aware of a car going very, very quickly. It had tinted windows, it was black, and I thought immediately it was a stolen car. Things started to come back. It was a big car, it was very wide tinted windows. They were the same colour as the car. You couldn't see it at all. He was tall, 
but he was very skinny, more like lanky. He wore like quite a thick gold bracelet, it looked quite expensive, and he had two rings. Just remembered that the earrings in the driver's ear, he had a denim jacket on and just the baseball cap that he was wearing. And just keep asking yourself, what did I do wrong? But if you hold it back and you just don't say anything and you're not going to upset anyone. I've got a teenage sister. She doesn't understand. How do you explain that there's people out there that do that? Dave, one of the first things that struck me about this, having seen the reconstruction, is not only what a terrible ordeal it was for her, but what a strange time in the morning, a strange time of day for it to happen. Yes, it is. It's a Monday morning, it's 8 o'clock, people going to work, busy city centre. A horrific attack, uh, made worse perhaps because of the broad daylight and the nature of it. What about the attacker? What can you tell us about him? Well, we've seen from the film, uh, Fiona, that this is a black man who's described as being six foot or taller, slim build, with a goatee type beard, with no moustache. Uh, and wearing a dark jacket and jeans. And he had this heavy jewellery, distinctive jewellery. Yes, he did, and that was shown clearly on the video, and uh, <coughs> members of the public might remember somebody who wears that type of jewellery with two distinct chunky gold rings. And then, strangely, the driver, who seemed happy to be there but didn't actually take part. That's right. Again, that's another unusual feature to this type of crime. Uh, this guy with the earrings distinctive in his left ear, that's four earrings. four down yeah, here. four earrings in his left ear, wearing a baseball cap and a white man driving the car. And the car, what can you tell us about the car? Well, we've shown it as a BMW because the uh, girl has uh, said that's as near as she could think it would be, but it's a large black saloon with grey or black leather interior and blacked out windows and a spoiler on the boot, similar to a 7 Series or a 5 Series BMW, but possibly something else. All right, so not necessarily BMW. No, not, not necessarily. Now, we saw in the film that there are some witnesses, or potentially some witnesses, that we want to get hold of. That's right. The guy who uh, asks for a light for a cigarette is a uh, guy who was on the bus with this girl. Um, he's not involved in any way, but we would like that man to come forward. He may hold vital clues for us. And then there was a couple... Luck of the devil, really, for, for the girl, because just as the man got his knife out, this couple walked past, but they just didn't see it, or didn't appear to see it. No, that's right. Uh, we don't know whether they're a couple, but certainly a man and woman, possibly on their way to work. Uh, they may recall this incident with this black man with his arm around this girl. We'd like to hear from them. And one thing we didn't show in the film was a possible witness after the event, after she was booted unceremoniously out of the car. That's right. We know that that was near to the Ford dealer as seen on the film and there was a woman there who was either taking into or getting out of a small green hatchback her two children. So it was a woman with a green hatchback that was there, perhaps on her way to or away from work and we'd like to hear from her. She may hold information about the vehicle. OK. One other thing is, of course, if you were on the M32, you saw there was a witness there as the, as the black BMW possibly swerved onto the motor with driving erratically, quite possibly driving at speed. If you saw anything like that, you think you might have seen the car, um, or you have any other information on this case, give us a call here in the studio, 0500 600 600, or the incident room on 0117 945 5055. And if you've been a victim of a crime and you'd like to talk to someone in confidence, you can call the victim support line. That's on 0845 30 30 900. Thieves come in all shapes and sizes and, as we'll see, all levels of competency. Look at these two in Syston in Leicestershire. They're intent on theft but just quite can't get their act together. Finally, they're off with a pair of jeweller's scales. Was that really what they wanted or was it just all they could reach? Their names, please. 0500 600 600 or 0116 222 222. This is a very unusual weapon. It's a flare launcher for sending distress signals made in 1942 by a German company, FZS. Now, we've just recovered it, but if you watched Crime Watch two months ago, you will have seen it in action in a robbery. This robbery, as well as a dozen others, are down to one man, and we need your help to stop them. And we're confident that this is the actual cap worn by the robber on the latest attack. So, where did the flare launcher come from, and who's been pointing it at 
uh, people in all these attacks. Ring 0845 60 70 treble 9. A lot of calls coming in, and if Crime Watch taps into the best of humanity, and as I say, all these people trying to help right now, this is a story of the worst. The callousness is almost beyond belief. It happened on the M4 near Junction 89, just past Maidenhead in Berkshire. <laughs> With a load of photographic chemicals and computer parts, the driver was heading west past Maidenhead to Swindon. I thought he's a police car. Then I decided well, maybe my, one of them, my friend, is driving on the same route. Assuming his friend might be in trouble, and since he had nothing of much value in the back, he pulled over. I was so scared because I never seen the gun in my life. <laughs> the violence was furious and they threw the driver's phone and other possessions out of the window. <laughs> but for all the aggression, there was no racial abuse. The men just seemed to be high on adrenaline. They argued about where to stop and to see what was in the back and then drove round country roads for something like two hours. When they did stop, it seemed to be in a council estate, probably somewhere between Heathrow and Staines. Right. Stay down and you don't look, you bastard! Look at that! <laughs> Take it on. Let me go. Get I don't want to go in there. It's too small. The red hatchback was N registered. Maybe the car that took part in the hijacking. I think about my family. I think about myself. I say, why it happened to me? Because I, I was totally helpless. The journey seemed to be to collect fuel. Having stopped at a petrol station, they drove straight back to the van. Right, get out! And having been terrified in the boot of the car, he resisted being crammed into the back of the van, which still hadn't been unloaded, and his tormentors relented. Immediately, the driver noticed a stench of diesel. It had been poured over the dashboard, seats and floor. The hijackers themselves must have reeked of diesel. It took them 15 minutes to get to Scott's Close in Stanwell. Then a 10 minute journey to Spout Lane and after an almost pointless hijacking and theft, they'd planned an almost pointless murder. Get down, get down! Stop, 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 stop! Shut up! Please. No, 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 please! No, 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 please! No, please! Please, no, no! 
a red car was waiting for them. Do you recognize the registration? If it had been petrol and not diesel, it would have exploded straight away. He'd certainly been killed. As we said, all the stolen goods, uh, well, they weren't much worth much, and they've all been recovered anyway, so the whole exercise was pointless. And we've underplayed the violence. Please help us find this gang. They're probably in their 20s. They have access to a red hatchback with an N registration and to another red car with a D registration, as you saw, probably D558. And, of course, they've got local knowledge of Stanwell. Call us here in the studio, or 01-784-44-6994. Coming up, we return to the murder of the girl who was heading for the Sydney Olympics. We've new CCTV from the night Sarah Cameron was killed. The EastEnders bus ride to murder. The dad killed for talking to himself. No, I don't know, you know what I mean? Say Shut nothing. up! a new technology which could help catch a sex attacker. Just to bring up to date with some of the calls we've been getting so far on that letter bomb, uh, which uh, was so terrifying a, a family, and the man was told you're not allowed to go into Swindon. We've had a name given, which is really quite interesting for a variety of reasons. Apparently there's a connection to a typewriter and a whole uh, other thing. As, as I speak, uh, another one has come in from an anonymous caller. And on the Bristol abduction, uh, the woman who was abducted at knife point. We've now got three names. I haven't yet been able to check whether they're all the same one. Keep the calls coming. You can email us if you're online at Crimewatch UK, that's CWUK, at bbc.co.uk. And if the phone lines are busy, and they are busy at the moment, please do keep trying. You can alternatively call the instant room numbers, of course. Uh, if you want to look them up, they're on CFAX on page 621. This man may be able to help with our next case. Who is he? He was buying petrol in the Vale of Glamorgan last August. The tiny village of St Athan in Wales isn't the sort of place where children are afraid to play in the streets. Last year, on the 10th of August, events took a sinister turn for one little 12-year-old girl. She was playing outside a takeaway shop with friends when two men drove past a couple of times in a gold maestro, tooting the horn. <laughs> Later on, a man appeared on a bicycle and told the young girl his name was Daniel and that he worked for the RAF. Was he stationed at the nearby base? He then pulled her around the corner, indecently assaulted her and hit her across the face. The girl was able to put this e-fit together. This man, fitting the description, was seen earlier that day and we'd like to talk to him. You can imagine how terrifying it must have been and how dangerous this sort of crime can become. Please just give us a call 0500 600 600 or 01446 731 602. This is Stephen Jackson who was wanted for drug dealing and robbery. Six viewers told us where he was but a seventh tipped him off and he fled just before police arrived. In the end, he turned himself in. He's been sentenced to nine years. It got too hot for William Woodman, too, whom we featured after he'd stabbed his girlfriend with a Turkish dagger. She only just survived. He's been sentenced to three years. And this is Darrell Evans from Coventry, named by two viewers, and he's now admitted 44 offences of handling and deception. You're a con man, said the judge, who's made this your profession, and jailed him for four years. Now an appeal to 18 people on a bus in the east end of London. Between them, they could hold the answer to a murder. Wade Hewitt was an unusual character, but harmless and kind. Hi, Lager. Hi, right, mate. Mm. I've seen you before. You knew, yeah? I come in all the time, mate, I tell you. All the time. Wade would speak to anyone, including himself sometimes. On a Thursday night five months ago, he went on a lone pub crawl around Plasto. Do you know what I mean? It's not, not common knowledge, eh? 
He lived in something of a dream world and fantasized that he was responsible for half the crime in the East End. Do you remember that? That was me, that was. Yeah, seriously, straight up. Honestly. He was a rogue. Uh, a fun-loving rogue. Couldn't believe anything he said, really. Come around here once on Mother's Day or something to get... And he's got a bunch of flowers with all the earth still sticking underneath it. We had took it out someone's garden. <laughs> it's that, you know, crazy. Wade lived in Dagenham with his girlfriend Zara and their daughter Paige, and he was heading back there from the Green Gate. To get home from Barking Road, he'd take the number five. It was now approaching midnight. Um, Wade used to have a drink, and um, when he had a drink, he used to, he used to talk to people, talk to people whether he had a drink or not. That was Wade. Yeah, can I try you out on? Go on. Now, the crucial part of this appeal. Do you ever take the number five up Barking Road? Could you have been travelling late on Thursday night last November? I'll find something. I'll have something to eat. I'm going to take You may have noticed, Wade. He was mumbling to himself. I mean... You might well recall if you got on at Barking Station that a woman and two young men barged in at the front of the queue. Two seventies. I don't know. That was too much for me to think about. I don't want to think about it now. Oh, so many people, man. What's going on? I was getting empty. I ain't got a clue. <laughs> I some taste want to get in or something, I don't know. I can't be bothered with all this. I don't need the people. Shut up. I don't know, do you know what I mean? Say Shut nothing. up, man. Oh, I'll get <laughs> Wade was stabbed several times. Do you remember that succession of bells to stop the bus on Longbridge Road between Thurlston Avenue and Meadway? From Meadway, they went down to Brixham Gardens, probably not where they live, and then the trail goes cold. We was in that hospital for 30 hours while I was on a life support machine. You know, we kept seeing his eyes flicker and we thought, oh, he's going to come round or something, but he just uh, never did. I we think it was probably the life support machine that was, you know, showing signs of life. But really, we, he was, uh, we was told really he was, he'd been sort of dead for hours. Were you embarking on the Thursday before bonfire night? Maybe you came from the station or one of the shops or pubs. Did you travel home on the number five bus? Remember the three who barred to the front of the queue? Maybe you'd noticed them earlier that night. He idolised Paige and she idolised him and he, he just loved her to bits. She just doesn't know where her dad's gone. And it's hard trying to tell her, like, Daddy's gone to heaven. She's going to be without her father for the rest of her life. Michael, when we put together these reconstructions on crime, watch some victims of the crimes can see appear slightly more sympathetic than others. Now, Wade didn't have an unblemished past, but he certainly didn't deserve this, did he? He certainly didn't, Fiona. Um, it's an unprovoked and callous attack on a defenceless and harmless young man, ostensibly just making his way home after a night out at the pub. It did. As you see, it seemed completely unprovoked. What can you tell us about, about the three people who were on the bus? The young people uh, involved, they're all black. Um, the two young men, um, they were about between 16 and 18 years of age, medium height and build, and uh, casually dressed. The, uh, the young girl was also casually dressed. She was about 14 or 15, uh, maybe, a schoolgirl, and we're particularly keen to speak to her. Why her? Why are you so keen to get hold of her? Well, if I was able to speak to her now, what I'd be saying to her, to her is this. Look, you're probably scared out of your wits. You're probably very very frightened. You've probably been expecting a, a knock on the door from the police for about five months now. You may even have been threatened not to, t to come to the police and uh, tell us what's happened. 
what remains clear to us is that it wasn't you that stabbed Wade. And I think the right thing for you to do is to come forward, seek police help and protection, and tell us what happened. Because if you don't, uh, and try and cover up this crime, then there could be serious consequences for you. She could get in a whole load of trouble. Obviously, it's so much better if she knows anything. It, well, she obviously knows something, but if she could actually come forward and help you. Now, there were other witnesses on the bus, weren't there? Still people you want to hear from? Yeah, we know that there are about 35 people that used the bus that night between uh, the Greengate pub and Longbridge Road. We've traced 17 of them. Uh, obviously, there's a number still outstanding, and uh, they, those that were on the bus when the crime happened couldn't have helped but know that it happened because the police and ambulance came and they were rushed away on another bus. OK, well, let's see what we can do tonight. If you're that girl, uh, give us a call. If you know that girl, give us a call. If you know anyone who was on that bus, if you're a witness on that bus, give us a call. Let's see if we can solve this. The last stabbing on a bus we covered was sold by Crime Watch viewers. Help us with this one too. And there's a £5,000 Crime Stoppers reward. Call us here in the studio or 020 7275 4336. Last May, we appealed for your help to catch the murder of a sports student, Sarah Cameron, who was killed as she walked home after an evening out in Newcastle upon Tyne. One year on, the police had new leads which could help catch a killer. She was going to work for the Sydney Olympic Organisation Committee. It was like a new life was about to open, as if she was going to really achieve what she wanted to do. I'm very, I was, I am a very proud father. Sarah was due to fly to Australia shortly and had spent the evening before Good Friday saying goodbye to friends at the quayside in Newcastle. When you hear about this, when the news is broken to you, you simply don't believe that something like this is happening. I mean, this was not in the script. You feel like you're in some kind of film, some horrible film or soap opera. At around 11.20, Sarah went to Monument Metro Station and caught the last train to Whitley Bay. Since last year, police have traced most of the passengers. But could you have been on that 11.35 from Monument? These three men in particular need to be eliminated from the inquiry. Sarah's home in Ersden is about a 25-minute journey, but this is Long Benton, four stops before she got off. Police aren't interested in prosecuting this man for getting onto the tracks, but they do need to know who he is and who his friend is. Shiremore Station, just before midnight. At the same time, a train arrived at Shiremore in the opposite direction. If you were on that train and haven't yet spoken to the police, please call us now. A local resident remembers Sarah heading down Park Lane towards Ersden and distinctly remembers a man passing him walking in the same direction. He then saw him cross the road and walk directly behind Sarah. Sarah turned onto the Ersden Road, followed by the man, who was now running. Around the same time, a driver saw a man running after a girl that he assumed to be his girlfriend. Sarah's body was found almost in sight of her front door. Her clothes and a number of her personal possessions had been removed, but some were found about a quarter of a mile away in a small wood beside Wellfield School. It's a den, and the killer may have played here long ago. If you've ever used the den, please get in touch. She had a short life, but she had a wonderful life. I just miss... I miss her smile. So, who killed Sarah? Whoever did it, he's probably in his late teens or in his twenties. He was certainly out late last year and the night before Good Friday, and he'd probably have come home pretty muddy. He knows Sharmore, Erston, and Wellfield, and he's fairly likely to have been to that den before, maybe as a child. 
It's been a long inquiry, but there is excellent DNA, so every suspicion can easily be checked out. 0500 600 600 or 01 661 863 000. Sometimes new technology can take an investigation forward. Last year, we appealed about a series of sex assaults across the south of England. The attacker grabs his victims near trunk roads and industrial estates. The M3 near Farnborough, the A1 near St Neots and at Boziat in Northamptonshire, just off the M1. I have never been so scared in my life. During the attack, he kept saying, make me feel good. Um, he would let me go. He was driving a light-coloured van, like a transit. His clothing's quite distinctive, a white shirt with New Zealand written on it, a blue and white striped rugby top and a T-shirt with an unusual geometric pattern. Last time we had two artist impressions of the suspect. You'd be hard pushed to say they were the same man, but using a new system called EvoFit, we now have a much more identifiable face. Who is the white van man? In this next case, the motive was unknown, but it could have been very serious indeed. It happened a month ago in Farnborough in Hampshire. I'm always aware of my surroundings. I've just, I've grown up that way, so it's just a natural instinct for me to be aware of who's behind me, who's next to me. I remember thinking to myself that it was quite nice to walk home when it was daylight. This is, um, when the clocks had just changed, so it was quite light out. I heard someone's footsteps behind me. It's a quiet place, it was a quiet evening. I didn't like it. Um, he just was stopped at the other, uh, on the other side of the street. It, it looked unnatural, so I just, I just picked up my pace. I just wanted to get home. Who is this man? Farnborough Town Centre on a Tuesday night a month ago. I thought, well, if I get under the second underpass and I get onto my street, if he just takes a right instead of a left, then it, it'll be fine and I'm just making a big fuss out of nothing. I thought that if I just stepped into the house that everything would be all right, that I would be safe. As I put the key into the door, I heard the footsteps behind me starting to run. It's almost a, a sickening feeling knowing that this person is trying to get into your home. Because this is where I live. He has no reason, no right to be inside my home. No! Shut up! No! Shut up! No! Shut up! No! It never crossed my mind to be submissive in any way. It just a survival instinct. It was definitely an instinct. I just did not want to suffer in any other way. Shut up. So I, I still had my key, and I think I managed to scratch his face with the key. Certainly one of her blows struck home, giving him a nosebleed. Several neighbours saw a man clutching his face, running from the house. He's pretty young, probably mid to late teens, with brown hair that was gelled down. He had bad acne and was wearing a jacket which was shiny beige, or grey with distinctive red stripes, and he may have had blood on his clothing. Now we've got DNA evidence so we can easily eliminate anyone who wasn't involved. 0500 600 600 or 01256 405 060. Coming up, two men wanted for questioning about serious violence. And who murdered Steve Jindu? There's a good reward and his family are desperate for information. An argument after a night out at a club. Things turn ugly and someone is murdered. In this case, so many people were involved that some of them are bound to be identified and we hope others will come forward. Marcus Hall lived with his family in Peckham in South London. He was 18 and at college doing IT, but was a part-time DJ too on the garage scene. There's always music, music, music. He, Marcus just used to compose the old bits of paper all over the place, you know. He was forever writing. He lived for his music, basically, even though it was his hobby, you know, he loved his music. About a month ago, Marcus went to a garage night at the Atmosphere Club in Chapel Street in Luton. He and his friends got into a fight. He tried to get away, but he was chased and stabbed and beaten to death. Marcus didn't stand a chance. I don't know what caused it, but at the end of the day, 
They didn't have to do Marcus like they did. They didn't have to stab him and beat him with baseball bats. There are good clues to the attackers, but first, two witnesses we hope will call us tonight. This man with a kebab saw them throw their weapons over a fence. He couldn't have known he was watching the finale to a murder. And this woman also had a good view. Tell us who they are. They shouldn't really be allowed to get away with this. No. And they've killed, taken a life. And it just started his life. It just started. Just going to college. It just started. He just turned 18. These men were all involved in the fight. They're all late teens or early 20s. One of them was wearing a distinctive Louis Vuitton green checked coat. Some of these pictures are indistinct, but even if you recognise one, it'll help. There's a big old. I'm waiting for him to come through the door. I'm looking in rooms to see if he's there, and I know he's not there, and I know he's not coming back. Help us to solve this one. Call us here in the studio, or you can call Crime Stoppers anonymously if you want, on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. Where were you on New Year's Eve? Well, you ought to remember that. If you live in South London, did you go to the Paradise Bar that night in New Cross? Or do you know anyone else who might have been there? If so, take a look at this. We had about 150 people in. I wouldn't say it was quite busy for us. My role is to be everywhere, just floating around, making sure the staff are OK, everything's running smoothly, and it was. But one man was causing complaints, rubbing himself up against girls. I saw him from about three metres harassing the girls, sort of holding onto her around the back, sort of trying to dance with them. He made me feel uncomfortable just by doing what he was doing. Can I have a word over here a minute, please? Why? Just Why? a word, look. You know me, man. I know you. I'm all right. You know I'm all right. Look, I just want to ask you to leave. Why? Look, it's near as easy. There's even an easy way or a hard way. I don't have to call the doorman in. I just want you to leave quietly. Don't let him back in the game, mate. He's trouble, Carlson. Did you complain about a man that night? Or were you one of the girls who was pestered by him? One was oriental and in her early 20s. I kept thinking it's New Year and I'm having a really lousy time. I'd fallen out of my boyfriend. Um, I'd lost my glove. I was on my own. I didn't have any money to get home. I lost my glove. Have you seen a glove? <sighs> I sat down on some steps and I just started to cry because everyone had gone and... I was really upset. You're right. Go away. Tell me what happened, babe. What, what's the matter? What's wrong, babe? Just come on, tell me what's wrong. What's wrong? I just had a, the worst night ever. I, I've had an argument with my boyfriend. Oh, no. I just want to go home. Oh, you're sick now. I lost my room. glove. You lost your glove? Well, look, I'll help you find your glove, yeah? Oh, babe, come on. Come on, just sit here. Okay, one, and look for it. Yeah, I'll help you. A lot of people might think I walked off the main road and that was stupid, and it was stupid. But when somebody's get, keeping you talking, you're not always aware of where you're going. When we came to a grassy area, in that split second, his face changed. Oh. His face looked really just like somebody evil. Oh. It sounds mad, but I started praying. Like I started thinking, I've got to get away. Please, somebody help me. He raped her, but soon after he started, she fought him off. And I kicked him as hard as I could, and he wasn't expecting it, so I managed to get him off of me. I'm sorry! Stop! Please, just stop! All right, I'm sorry! He was running after stop. me, and then to try and Please, say you're sorry. Stop. I just wanted to get away from him. Literally, I was just starting to sit down myself after checking all the tools and everything like that. There was a knocking at the door, a loud knocking at the door. Hey, this bloke's just trying to attack me! Don't let me! He was insisting to talk to her, and I was just saying, look, just go. She doesn't want to talk to you. I felt safe, that I knew I was somewhere where I was with other people. I mean, they offered to find the police. 
I just wanted to forget about the whole thing, really. She was in such a state the police weren't called till later, and the rapist eventually wandered off. This may be him an hour later in New Cross Road, but if it isn't, we need to eliminate this sighting. I wish I hadn't worried about the glove. I wish I hadn't worried about any of that stuff, because it seems so unimportant now. It just kind of haunts me, and the image of his face haunts me. People in the club think the rapist may well have been Somali. He'd certainly been in the Paradise Bar before, usually to the jazz night on Wednesday evenings. Call us if you've any idea who he is. 020 8284 8335. We've got the names, have you got the addresses? Both are wanted for questioning about serious violence. In one case, a man was stabbed in the back, and in another, someone was left in a coma for a month. Geoffrey Bowles is six foot and may make frequent trips to Spain. Luke Anderson is also six foot, but just 19, with a Coventry accent and the name Michel tattooed on his left arm, along with a flag of St George. 0500 600 600. A complete mystery now. We're not even sure what we're appealing for, but any piece of information, however small, could give this case a chance. On a Saturday night last set November, Steve Jindu was in a bar in Ealing, West London. When he left, he got a lift with a friend to Greenford and then just disappeared. Three days later, his body was found half a mile away on Horsedon Hill. His throat had been cut and he'd been stabbed repeatedly in his back and the head. Did you know, Steve? Have you heard anything since November which could help? Who might have taken against him so violently and why? There's a £5,000 reward. His devastated family is at a complete loss to understand what happened to him, so please give us a call 020 8247 7821. And we'll be back at 10.35 to tell you what's going on. Maybe we'll have a rest by then. Just tell you, the Jill Dando Institute is formally inaugurated tomorrow thanks to generosity of Crime Watch viewers. Thank you for watching. Thank you for helping to cut crime. Don't have nightmares. Sleep well. Good night. Good night.